Hello everybody, this is Jeff Janess, and welcome to our GIS lab on hydrologic analysis with special attention to watersheds and surface flow patterns. These hydrologic functions are pretty cool and they let you use GIS to analyze the shape of the landscape in some sophisticated and interesting ways. Now, the methods we'll discuss here only apply to surface hydrology, which is guided by the shape of the land. These methods are all based on the fact that water flows downhill, and this is a whole different animal than analyzing groundwater movements. That requires knowledge of spatial distribution of aquifers, which we don't have. So we're going to stick to the surface stuff in this lab. Surface stuff can be pretty cool and powerful, though. For example, we're going to generate the watershed that drains into Picture Canyon. We're also going to do some stuff with flow accumulation, which basically tells us the catchment size for every cell on the landscape. This flow accumulation raster is then useful for finding stream paths, and it's also good for finding areas where flow concentrates, might be therefore susceptible to flash flooding. It's also used for generating a general index of topographic wetness, referred to as TWI, which can then be useful for habitat analysis and is a popular index for ecosystem researchers and land managers. And it's an interesting way to describe the landscape, so I'm going to go into some more details on it shortly. Finally, we're going to apply some tools we've used before to calculate slope and aspect statistics within the watershed, and we'll also take a look at how to find the distance through the hydrologic network. Now, all of this magic starts with the flow direction, and we need to know exactly which direction water flows over every point on the landscape. There's a few methods for doing this. In this lab, we're going to use a method called the D8 method, which stands for eight direction. Basically, it's just a way to steer the water into the single neighboring cell with the steepest slope. It's the simplest method and one that produces data that can be used as inputs for other ArcGIS hydrologic tools. So it's a good one, and it's the one we're going to use. But I'd like to just briefly explain what the other two methods are so you'll be familiar with them. They're interesting, and they provide generally more precise hydrologic statistics. They're more sophisticated, but unfortunately they don't all produce data in a format that all the other tools can use as inputs. So they're less useful for several other purposes than the simplest method. Now the first alternative method is called MFD for multiple flow direction. It actually sends water into every downslope cell. And in this example, we see four neighboring cells that are downslope from the central cell. And so this method will actually steer water into all four of those. The one with the steepest slope will get the greatest proportion of flow. Second method is called DINF, which stands for infinite direction. And infinite, in this case, just means that it can be any value between the range of 0 and 360 degrees. Doesn't mean that there's an infinite number of directions it'll steer into. It's basically just the aspect direction, and this method steers the water into the steepest downslope direction. So in this case, the aspect of that central cell is 158 degrees, and so this method would send water flow in exactly that direction. Now, just to confuse things, it's not exactly the same as aspect. The tool uses a slightly different algorithm, so you come up with a slightly different number. But also the tool calculates direction in mathematical direction instead of compass direction. So remember that in compass directions, zero degrees means due north. Values increase when you go clockwise, but in the mathematical direction, zero degrees means due east, and values increase counterclockwise. For those of you who don't remember polar coordinates from trigonometry class in high school, let me quickly show you the difference between that and compass direction. In forestry and in most ecological and land management fields, we consider north to be zero degrees on the compass and values increase in a clockwise direction. So east is at 90 degrees and south is at 180 degrees. Whenever you calculate or measure aspect, then those aspect values are recorded using this system. Mathematicians, on the other hand, more commonly calculate direction in the form of polar coordinates where east is at zero degrees and values increase going counterclockwise. In this system, north is at 90 degrees and west is at 180 degrees. And actually, direction is generally reported in radians. Now, the folks who wrote this DINF tool apparently used the mathematical strategies. So the DINF values are reported in degrees counterclockwise from east. And in this example, an aspect of 158 degrees compass bearing is equivalent to a DINF value of 292 degrees. Now, they both mean the same direction, though. 
Now, just because I like geometry puns, I'm going to go off on a quick tangent here. I mentioned earlier that when mathematicians use this polar coordinate system to report direction, they usually report the value in radians counterclockwise of east instead of degrees. And I've actually found that many people don't remember what a radian is you know, from way back in their high school math classes, and so here's a quick refresher. A radian is just the radius of the circle, or the distance from the center of the circle to the edge, draped around the edge of the circle. So walking one radian around the edge of the circle would be equivalent to walking from the edge of the circle to the center. Going halfway around the circle requires roughly 3.1415 radians, which you might remember is the value of pi. So 180 degrees halfway around the circle is equal to pi radians. Going all the way around the circle requires two pi radians, and it's easy enough to convert from radians to degrees. Okay, that's probably enough on the geometry. Let's get back to our discussion of flow directions. Now remember, we're going to be using the D8 method to calculate flow direction. It's the most versatile for later on hydrologic analysis. and simple and gets the job done. So let's take a closer look at this D8 method of determining flow direction. We start with our DEM. We see all the elevation values scattered across all those cells. Suppose we want to figure out the slope direction from this particular cell here. The D8 method is going to flow into one of the eight neighboring cells, and the question is which of those eight neighboring cells has the steepest downhill slope. Algorithm calculates the percent slope in each of those eight directions, identifies which of those cells has the steepest downhill slope, and then directs the flow direction exactly and straight into that particular cell. Then it does this for all the cells on the landscape, so we come up with a raster of flow direction values. Then we use this full raster of flow direction values to calculate all of our surface hydrologic functions, including the watershed that drains into Picture Canyon. And now that we have this cool flow direction raster, we can use it for a number of hydrologic functions, including finding out where water would flow from any point on the landscape. And this gives us information we can use to easily calculate the entire catchment that drains into any particular point on the landscape. We use exactly these methods to calculate the entire catchment area that drains into Picture Canyon. Now the process works incrementally, one cell at a time. You're at a cell and you figure out which cells, if any, drain into it. Then you move to those cells and you repeat the process, and you just keep going until you don't find any more cells draining into your location. Before you know it, you have the whole watershed. Now, fortunately, the GIS tools handle all this for you, all based on that flow direction raster. Now, all this is fine as far as it goes, but the success of all these surface hydrologic functions make an important assumption about the underlying flow direction raster. Basically, they all assume that there is some outward flowing direction from every cell. Some neighboring cell has to be either lower in elevation, or at least equal in elevation, in order for water to flow in that direction. But if all neighboring cells are higher than some particular cell, then there is no outflow direction. In these cases, surface hydrologic functions simply stop. Regions like these are called sinks on the landscape, and what these sinks mean to you primarily is that your flow direction raster will no longer allow for continuous movement across the landscape. Flow direction raster will try to send water from a cell into the lowest neighboring cell, but the neighbor is higher than the cell, so the neighbor just sends the water right back. When flowing water reaches these sinks, it stops. This means that any analysis that uses this stream flow, such as defining watersheds or drainage routes, will also stop. So the solution is simply to fill these sinks. And fortunately, there's an ArcGIS tool that's designed for exactly this. So we go to our toolboxes, we look in the spatial analyst tools, we go down to hydrology, and here we go, it's the fill tool. Open it up, we give it our DEM that needs to be filled, we have to give it a new name, and this is going to be the output raster that'll have all these holes filled. Now the Z limit is a measure of how deep you're willing to go, and sometimes you have genuine pits and valleys on your landscape that you don't want filled. So here you can set a threshold. If the pit is greater than, say, 20 meters, then you're just going to leave it as a true depression on the landscape. So we've run this fill tool on our DEM, and it finds all those sinks. Then it simply increases the elevation values of the cells in those sinks until there is hydrologic flow through them. So now when we run the flow direction tool, we get a raster that really does allow continuous movement through the landscape. 
Now, just to be clear, the fact that you have sinks to be filled doesn't mean your original DEM was wrong. The actual landscape has plenty of real low spots and drainages that don't stop the true flow of water. When a real stream encounters a low spot, it just fills the pool until the water is high enough to drain out the other side, and then it continues flowing downstream. The reason we had to fill the sinks for this hydrologic analysis is that these hydrologic tools just aren't near as sophisticated as the real world. They treat flow direction cells as if they were one-way streets, and you just can't go the wrong way on a one-way street. We only use the filled DEM to produce a working flow direction raster, and then we want to calculate other surface and topographic analyses like slopes or aspects, well then you're really better off going back to your original DEM. Your original DEM is going to give you more accurate topographic derivatives of elevation than your filled DEM. Now I've mentioned TWI or Topographic Wetness Index a few times now and it is such a popular measure to calculate that it's worth a little extra explanation. Basic calculation is not that complicated. It's a function of two variables, slope and watershed size. And essentially the TWI at any point of the landscape is calculated as the size of the watershed that drains into that point divided by the slope at that point and then you take the natural log of that quantity. So value is sometimes referred to as the CTI, or Compound Topographic Index, and as I mentioned, is a function of slope and catchment area. Catchment area is the same as the watershed that drains into the point. And therefore, TWI serves as a measure of potential water concentration at a point. And since we're dividing catchment area by slope, large watersheds tend to produce high TWI values, and shallow slopes also tend to produce high TWI values. Both of these scenarios combined tend to mean a large amount of water potentially draining over a site combined with a shallow slope so the water moves slowly. Areas with high TWI values might have more water available than the general landscape and consequently different vegetation communities and wildlife habitat characteristics. Now, of course, this depends some on the climate and rainfall patterns in an area. TWI was originally designed specifically for humid and temperate areas in which the size of the watershed could likely be highly correlated with the amount of water flowing over a location. In drier climates, such as the southwestern United States, it's not uncommon to have locations in drainage bottoms with very large watersheds, yet which rarely have any actual flow. In these dry climates, TWI may be a less important predictor of vegetation type or habitat quality than in more mesic areas. And remember also that water concentration in an area is also affected by soil characteristics and subsurface features. If two places have the same slope and catchment area, then they're going to have the same TWI values even if one location is on bare rock with no potential for water infiltration and the other is deep sand. Now, given all that, however, TWI is still a popular measure to calculate, often gives at least somewhat useful and informative information. One common problem people have with it, though, is that the equation usually can't be applied to the entire landscape. Remember, you can't divide by zero, so this equation can't be applied to any location where the slope is zero. You also can't take the log of zero, so you can't apply this to areas with no watershed, and that would be any location that has no upstream cell, like ridgelines or mountaintops. So just to avoid violating these mathematical rules, we often set a minimum non-zero slope value, and we often add a small constant value to the watershed size. And then there's this question of specific catchment area. Now, this unit contour length thing is kind of a vague term, but it means the width of the flow path at the location you're analyzing. So technically, specific catchment area is not the same as catchment area or watershed, but the current raster-based methods for calculating TWI treat them as identical. This is because the raster-based methods treat flow paths as linear paths with a width of one cell. And of course, on the actual landscape, these flow paths can be wider than one cell. Now, the original manuscripts described in this method didn't use these raster-based methods, and therefore they were able to standardize the watershed size by the width of the flow path. So remember that the width of a flow path has a lot to do with water concentration, just as the size of the watershed does. If the water draining from an area is flowing in a drainage several hundred meters wide, it's going to have a lower water concentration than if it's flowing in a drainage only a few meters wide. You can also imagine that the water concentration will be less if the water is flowing over a convex surface like you see here, because the flow path is just going to get wider as it flows down the hill. The original methods were able to account for this, and so they used this specific catchment area in the equation, which is defined as the catchment area divided by the width of the flow path at the location you're analyzing. 
And this actually raises another point about how TWI is used most often today. There's nothing stopping you from using the equation to calculate TWI for this specific area here. You just calculate the area of the watershed and divide it by the width of this flow path here and then run that through the rest of the equation. It gives you a single TWI value for this particular area. However, these days we more commonly use these raster-based methods to calculate TWI for every cell in the landscape. By definition, that means you're using a flow path width of one cell. So in the equation where you take the catchment area, you just divide that by the width of the cell. And despite the drawbacks I described earlier about TWI, it, it often does serve as an informative predictor variable for ecological analysis. Anyway, if you're interested in TWI, take a look at the papers in this zip file. The Beaven and Kirby paper describes the original equation, also mentions that it's designed for humid and temperate environments. Okay, so I think that's enough for a brief introduction into the topping, so let's go ahead and start in on those labs. You're going to do several cool things in these labs. Obviously, you're going to create a watershed like we've been looking at based on that flow direction raster. We're also going to do a flow accumulation analysis, which would help us identify where streams are on the landscape. This will also be a basis for the TWI, or the Topographic Wetness Index, so you'll see how to make that. We'll do some of the basic surface analyses that we've done before, you know, calculating the slope and aspect across the landscape. We'll also calculate the area within this Picture Canyon watershed that lies within certain slope ranges, and how much of it lies in north-facing versus south-facing slopes, or if it's just flat with no aspect at all. And as I mentioned earlier, we'll take a quick look at TWI, the Topographic Wetness Index. We're also going to try an interesting analysis where we calculate the distance between two points when the travel path is restricted to the hydrologic network. Now, for example, some species may do just fine traveling in a straight line between these two ponds, but not all species can cross overland. Fish species, and some amphibians and invertebrates, they can't cross open ground like this, so they care a lot more about the distance through the network of drainages, streams, and rivers. This kind of analysis is something we have to do sometimes, and it'll also give us a chance to try some ArcGIS Pro networking functions. Anyway, I think this is a fun lab, and I think you'll enjoy it. Good luck, everybody. Mm -hmm.